Hi, welcome to Matt's Garage. Lots of progress since the last episode. Having the tub painted has really made it possible for me to knock a bunch of stuff out. I'm gonna walk you through some of the challenges, some of the successes. This episode is gonna be like detailed uh, restoration ideas, challenges, things like that. You might pick up one thing from this episode that'll help you out in your job, your project, your project. Obviously the engine bay is coming together. I finished doing my heater hoses. So these are 5 8 hoses. Um, I just got a standard uh, valve and sort of checked the distance to my heater control valve, which I'm moving in the Scout. So again, 5 8 heater hose. Um, the one out of the manifold is the out and the water pump is suction, I think, on the small blocks. but. This is just a temporary to hold it there. Um, I also got my EVAP canister hooked up. So there's not that much information on putting an EVAP canister in because most guys just take them and throw them in the trash. So let me just walk you through how this works. First, the line from the fuel tank. That's this plastic line that comes from the fuel tank. So your fuel tank vent comes, it's got a rollover valve back at the tank. It comes up, I hope this is in focus comes up into the evap canister. This captures those fuel vapors, okay? Then the carb sucks those fuel vapors out and the air that feeds through here to let the is comes from this air vent. Now, this comes with like a cap that just allows air in, but it's not filtered, so I actually um, hooked it up I took a PCV valve and I just hollowed out the uh, the bottom and then I took a PCV grommet and put it at the bottom of my air filter. So this just sticks in the bottom of the air filter and that's my fresh air vent. Now what you don't want is it uh, sucking those vapors all the time. You really only want it when the engine's warm. So in line here I've installed a um, vacuum, a heat actuated vacuum switch. It's a PV72 or 71. So it's got two in, one goes to the throttle body, the ported, ported outlet on the throttle body. And when the engine gets the temp, this sucks. Now, if this is creating too much of a vacuum leak, you can also put in a small little restrictor in line here and that'll reduce the vacuum leak. It doesn't need much to purge the EVAP canister. Then I got my battery box and the heater recovered. Oh, here's a tip. I have these in like three different sizes. I think they sell them at the uh, Harbor Freight. So down in here somewhere, there's a hole. You see that daylight? That's where the control comes in for a flap that's on the heater vent. Now this is generic. This works for anything. It didn't line up. So what I did was I shoved this in and it, it, it I forget what it's called. It's like bowling or... We use it in the industrial application when you're trying to get steel members to line up and it doesn't work. You, you stick something conical in there and then you, you wrench it and then you, you force it into alignment and then you bolt it down. That's how I got that to fit. I had Miss, Mrs. Matt Scratch pulling from that side, then I bolted the heater down. But that applies to a lot of different things. Okay, so that's the passenger fender. Um, the hood release. I had modified, you see I added a section at the bottom there. There's a hole at the bottom here. So that's gonna be where my um, custom hood release latch comes through. Uh, have I ever shown that? Let me just grab it. This is a stock Scout parking brake assembly. And what I did was I added on this piece and then a holder here so that I can take my old low car transmission kick down lever and go like this to open the hood. So if you ever need to make a custom hood opener, that's all you really need. You need a point to fix the cable in and then a point of leverage. And that's gonna make it way easier because normally it's a knob on the dash and everyone just uses, uh, that knob rips off after a while and people use vice grips to open their hoods on the Scouts. I also modified this. This had a really goofy parking light setup. So what I did was I welded on this tab with a weld nut so I can just screw in a normal, um, door light, dome light switch that's in your door jam here. And then that's that's my new uh, parking brake light switch will be here. So much cleaner, much more uh, serviceable setup. 
while I'm over in this section of the garage, this is my radiator hose and I had, the, the, the label is long gone. So if you've got a custom application, make sure you write your radiator hose numbers down because I, that's like off of a Ford something or other. I, would, I don't even know how my builder figured out how to use that back in when I had the uh, spring overdone back in 09. Um, but I found one photo that he sent me during the progress builds that had the label on it. So luckily I'm able to get another one, but I would have I never figured that out. Okay, back to the build. On the driver's side fender, I've got the Tom's Bronco parts um, multi-unit. It's got the washer and then the um, heater uh, radiator reservoir on this side. And then I got the stock Ford uh, washer and then I got this uh, pigtail off of uh, Summit. So that, that's going to be nice factory wire, wiring there for the fluid washer reservoir. Moving on down, I made this custom ECU cover for the affordable fuel injection. This comes out nice and easy, goes back in. It's a super nice setup they give with that affordable fuel injection. And then I've got my fuel and power relays and my OBD sensor up here. So easy to access on the driver's side. And then, you know, I've got a mess of wires. Uh, and actually, everything's pre-terminated. Like that's the uh, engine temp. All that stuff's really easy. The, um, this is the uh, intake air temperature, which I also just kind of popped into the uh, air cleaner uh, using some ingenuity because that's an MPT. So I actually cut down an MPT bolt. You know, let me show you. So most of these sensors are MPT because they're meant to be threaded into the block or something. So this is 3 8 MPT and I got a um, bushing that adapts a 3 8 to a half inch MPT. I cut that down and then I, I spaced it out with some rubber. I know that's cheesy. I might get just one thick piece of rubber. But basically now that's the sensor, um, sensor mount that goes on there and then the ECT sensor plugs in there and then that's, that's my grommet for the uh, for the PCV valve for the air intake for the EVAP canister. Okay, Hydro Boost. Now, I've got, um, this is all stock Chevy gear from a 89 K2500 diesel because the diesel Chevys had Hydro Boost because they don't have engine vacuum like a gas engine has. So, um, Hydro Boost from that and this. Now, the problem is, when you buy a Hydro Boost, they don't come with the little plunger thing in there. And that, you really need that to be dead on accurate. Uh, so I actually had a Junkyard Hydro Boost and I used that plunger. And the relationship of that plunger to the master cylinder on that Ford Astro, or Chevy Astro application. And then I ordered a push rod, one push rod. And I basically cut that down and kind of machined it on a, on a drill press to the exact dimension, sorry, I'm not gonna focus here, the exact dimension for that. So now that's that works. And then uh, one little hiccup is that the Chevy proportioning valve is exactly the same, but in this application of Chevy, this isn't for all of them. The, um, the disc brake is in the back and the drum brake is in the front. So I had to make these crossover brake lines to swap them because the ones that came didn't work and then it comes with a nice mount so it's up off of the fender which is how it came on scouts originally and down there somewhere is my o2 sensor you can't really see it but it's it's down right over there and then i mounted my coil let's see if i can show you sideways right there that's the coil pack for the distributor that comes with the uh affordable fuel injection, and it's an electronically controlled distributor by the ECU. That's the throttle body for the uh, for the affordable fuel injection. Standard sort of Chevy technology, but with upgraded Siemens injectors. And then I made this throttle back bracket for my low car accelerator um, cable, and then just put a kick up at the end for the return springs. I had to drill out because this is like a stock Chevy TBI connector for a stock Chevy throttle. So I just drilled it out and then made a bushing by drilling through a bolt, cutting it off, and then putting it through the hole in the back and then put the carb mount 
carb accelerator cable mount in here and then bolted it. It was a big thing. I've got my stock PCV lines. Uh, what else do I need to show you over here? Oh, this is the uh, map sensor up here. So that is the engine bay. I've got my, this is the old, uh, this is the old belt, but it's on there just to, because I wanted to, I couldn't, because of this, I couldn't use the normal Chevy uh, thermostat housing. So I'm gonna reuse my old one. Never sealed, but I think I'm gonna figure out why. So, oh, oh, and then um, for Hydro Boost, what I did was I was originally gonna try to use Chevy lines, but they're all so custom that you can't, there's no flexibility. So instead, they're all kind of like this return line you see that's that's kind of fixed, right? So there's just no room to maneuver. It's only a little bit of rubber in it. So I went to Pertec, Pertec, and had 3000 PSI hydraulic hoses made with AN fittings, and I went to Summit and bought the metric O-ring, so 16 millimeter metric O-ring, and 18 millimeter metric O-ring to AN adapters, and then a 90, and then that way I don't have to worry about clocking, and then that goes down to the uh, power steering unit. This is again off of a diesel K2500, and the reason for that is it has dual dual return ports, which you need for Hydro Boost. One return from the power steering, and one from the Hydro Boost unit. Um, I tried to do the wiring, with, but these um, Rams horse manifolds are kind of a pain. You can't um, you can't really go over them without straight wires, then just kind of messy. So the proper way is to go under them, but then you have heat issues. So I just ordered a set of Corvette heat shields that basically protect the wires and I can run it under here, back up the engine block and up to the distributor and then it'll be a super clean install. Uh, that giant hole in my firewall is for a 22 pin um, bulkhead fitting. So I have a nice seal. I don't have to run all my wires through a grommet. I just have the bulkhead and I can unbolt it and disconnect the whole wiring system from um, the chassis to the body. So that's really nice, but it's gonna take a lot of work. So this is a cheapo chrome two inch steering column, 32 inch long, I think. But basically Scouts had Chevy Vega steering columns. It's, it's all Chevy stuff. And, and actually most, it really doesn't matter except for the uh, wiring connections. Cause as long as you can get the connection to your steering box, like, and safely hold this into place, it's gonna work. So I've got a nice big old school steering wheel to go on this, uh, I'll save for another episode, but it's pretty decent actually for, I think it was uh, 150 bucks or something on Amazon or eBay or something. The only trick is with the Scouts and other vehicles, there's a built-in mount here that attaches, you know, to the holder. Well, let me see if I can zoom in. Flaming River makes this piece that actually pinches a new uh, steering column that doesn't have that. So you can actually set this up anywhere. So I just sat in my seat and got it to where I wanted it. And there's a few positions I was happy with and then I went to the other side. There's a Borgeson U-joint there. It's ex insanely expensive. So, the, oh, geez, let me see if I can get that. So now I've got, you know, pretty pretty beefy steering situation. Same as before, but it's adapted to this column. And then I made a custom collar with rubber. Oh, I know I'm all over the place, but this is, I, I got a lot to catch up on. So. Uh, one thing that comes in really handy during restorations is buy a sheet of like one eighth and one quarter, a sheet of hydrometer black rubber. It comes in a square like this, but what that's allowed me to do is make my own like gaskets for sealing up the, where the heater meets to that or where the, um, where the steering column collar sits on the firewall. So I'll put some RTV and then put that on there and then a, there's some give to it and it's nice and um, it, it looks super clean, it's easy to cut and that stuff comes in handy everywhere. Like anytime you wanna put like basically not metal, not touching metal, you can use that hydrometer rubber. It's, it's pretty good. I mean, you can't put it on a manifold or something but it's pretty heat resistant and it's, it's good stuff. So just Google hydrometer rubber 
uh, sheets and then you'll you'll see them there. Really handy during any restoration. Uh, that's my carpet kit. Not going in right now. Uh, the other thing I'm trying to get is the dash. So I've got two speed hut gauges, speedo and tack, and then everything else that I want here. I don't want to use the Bronco one because you got to look. Sorry, let me back up. This is a Bronco blank dash cover because my scout dash is long, long gone. So I ordered this from Wild Horses and I'm modifying it to become a scout dash actually. So I've already like put holes in there to tie into my thunder thighs that tie into my cage. Um, by the way, my cage is powder coated along with everything else. I don't think I've ever shown you guys. Sorry, let me finish this up. So, so anyway, so it's just tricky getting the angles because the Broncos have this. So I'm figuring out how to bevel this down and then build it up. And that's just, that's like one of the last big fabrication jobs I have to do. But basically it's going to be super, um, it's going to be very sparse in here. There's just going to be headlight, wiper. This, the speaker's not here. I mounted the speaker underneath. Uh, ignition. None of this is one stereo, my heater controls, and I'm trying to figure out if I even want a glove box. But it's gonna be a very, very minimalist dash. And then what I wanted to show you in the cage was, one trick is like I went in and I drilled little holes here, here. I drilled a hole under here so that I can run wires in my cage to my dome lights there in the front. And then also, I've got holes down here to run into my speakers and holes back there. And then I, I can run power to my air compressor, my onboard air compressor that sits back there behind the cage. Um, and then my subwoofer that's on this side. The shifter saga. So I've got these twin sticks from JB. I had to bend the snot out of these to make them work. And I did that a while ago. I had to put the body on with it because I can't get the bolt that holds these in without with the body on basically. So to make a JB work on a Scout AX15 to Scout Dana 20, you gotta cut an ear off of the shifter and then switch to a twin stick. That's one mod, the other mod is you have to cut 3 8 off the back of the AX15 output shaft. So that's in, and then I've got my, I went to go put in my AX15 shifter and I didn't have first, third, and fifth, but I bench tested it. So what the deal? Well, the shift rail has this plug, uh, the shifter selector has this rail that it sits on. I'd put it in backwards. So actually I had to take the transfer case off, pull that thing out, put it back on, put the RTV, put it back on. It only took me about an hour and a half, but if you're ever doing an AX15 transmission rebuild, make sure that you shift test it with the rear shift rail um, completely set up, put the shifter on and shift it. Uh, and with that plug in the back end, because if that plugs out, it'll ride in, it'll shift, and then you then you put the plug in, it prevents that rail from moving back if you have it backwards. It's a pretty common mistake, just, you know, knowledge for you not to make the same mistake I did. So I got the shifter in, and let me show you, I know I have it somewhere. Somewhere in my pile of never-ending crap. Anyway. So I ordered one set of twin stick shifters and um, it came with these rubber boots for the twin sticks, okay? And a ring that I'm having trouble finding right now. In my effort to bend it on the press without heat, which I don't recommend because it's stainless, um, I broke one. So I had to order another one. And this time I knew which bends I needed to make, so I only needed to press it once in one direction, once in another, and I had it clear. And that's why it's set up like that now. It's because I got it bent to be out of the way of the body. But when I did that, I ordered the more premium um, shifter boot that's like leather, okay? I've kind of already taken it apart a bit, but basically it sits like that, super pretty, whatever. Here's the issue. It only works if your shifter tower is right next to your sheet metal. In other words, if your transfer case is sitting low at all, um, which I have to in this setup, these things from JB Custom, they don't flex at all. And same with the rubber, they just don't flex these little witch hats for the twin stick. So 
Um, I and, and that pattern doesn't work. It doesn't sit in the same spot because of the adapters or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reuse this witch hat for the um, AX15 shifter, and I'm going to have Mrs. Matt's Garage sew me up a new one of these with a little floppier witch hats for the twin stick shifter. Which brings me to my next thing, which is, well, how do I put those, how do I put those in there, right? Because I don't have a base and it doesn't know, I looked at round bases and square bases, and out, but there's just not enough room between the stick shifters and the, sorry, the uh, transfer case shifters and the stick shift to actually have two separate bases. So what I did was, oh, I took the scout uh, tunnel cover and I made new holes and closed the old holes uh, because you know it was an automatic and the transfer case is in a different spot. And then I made a boot cover that now goes on there and then I welded weld nuts to the back so that I can just, my, my intent is, uh, sometimes scouts run with this exposed and sometimes they run them under the carpet. Because I've had to hack this up and re-weld it, I'm going to run this under the carpet and then I'm just going to get this powder coated and that and the, um, and then I'm going to put the carpet over it and then I'm going to get this powder coated and put this over on top so you'll only see this on the floor of the scout. It'll be super clean. Woo! Man, I'm going a million miles an hour. But like I said, a lot has gotten done. Leaks. So I have been chasing brake leaks like crazy and I've learned a couple things I was doing wrong. So let me spit the knowledge. You tell me if I'm wrong. First, when you're setting in a new brake um, fitting, you, you got to like wrench it down, back it up, wrench it a little further, back it up, wrench it even further, back it up, and then wrench it a fourth time. You can't just get it right on the first time and keep tightening. You got to kind of give it room to reseat. You got to make sure that goes in straight. Um, I've tried before to make brake lines that didn't leak and failed miserably using the double flaring tool. But I figured out the secret and it's in the instructions. You really do have to bevel the outside edge of it and really deburr it. With the 3 16 brake lines, they're so small with the little deburring thing on the, on the pipe cutter tools. They don't really fit, so what I just use is a razor blade, like a utility knife, and I deburred with that. I chamfered the outside edge. I put like tapping, uh, tap magic oil on the fittings when I was pressing them, and it, they were great and sealed fine, actually. Those weren't my problems. I was putting the old like rear brake line on the, master, on the old uh, drum brake cylinder. What's it called? Yeah, I think it's called a cylinder. The drum brake cylinder. Uh, those are I was just having you just have to chase them down and, and find them um, I still there's still two systems that may leak I don't know the power steering because I haven't charged it or anything and the fuel so you know what you know wish me luck on the leaks because those just basically stop you in your tracks um, I can't test I don't want to test the fuel line system I don't want to put fuel in the truck till like I'm ready to fire so what's it going to take to fire? Well, I need to do the wiring. And in order to do the wiring, I need to land the stuff somewhere inside the cab. So now that I've gotten this tunnel done, which was the other big fabrication thing I need to do, now I can turn my attention to the dash, get the dash set up, and then I can start running my wires to that. And then once I do that, I think I'm... I don't think there's any other systems here that need attention because I've got my clutch. I need to bleed everything, obviously, but I got my clutch master cylinder, which is just a Wilwood brake um, master cylinder, single single reservoir brake master cylinder. Like the racing guys will have like three of them, one for the clutch and one for each of the brake pedals. So just use one of those. Um, and then the um, advanced adapters kit comes with a Toyota. Land Cruiser slave cylinder down there that mounts on the custom bell housing that adapts from the Chevy 350 to the AX15. So that system's done. My power steering is pretty much done. I gotta put my radiator in and then um, 
route my cooler for the power steering lines and then back to the return. So that's done. Do my water neck, not a big deal. It's all like details. I just got to do the uh, like the spark plug wires, route them once those heat shields come in, and then really just build my electrical. So once I do that, I'll be ready to fire. So yeah, the thing about it, there's just so many details. Like for, if I put my fuel filler in, I won't be able to do great body work around the fuel filler hole. So I'm also just waiting for my DA sander to come so I can do that body work by the fuel filler hole before I put the fuel filler in. Stupid little detail, but these things matter. What else have I done? Oh, I finished my exhaust. Let me show you. See here, I, I took this apart because I thought the master cylinder was leaking, but actually what happened, it was leaking so bad, it filled, uh, it filled up here and it just kept dripping even after I had stopped the leaks, I think. So I basically put a paper towel as a witness so that if I come back in the morning and there's oil still, or there's oil dripping, I know, I know there's a, I know there's a leak. All right, let's get under here. Whoa, tight quarters. All right. So what am I going to do here? All right. I think I showed you guys that. I think I showed you guys that I have my white pipe coming here uh, and then it comes over and back up. Then I've got my catalytic converter here. Let me go the other way. So I got my catalytic converter here. It's a little far for my taste because you want it to warm up quickly, but that's where I needed to go. Uh, Summit turbo muffler and then I have it coming out. Um, out between the spring and the frame rail and I check to make sure that it hits my bump stop before it hits the uh, before it hits the exhaust pipe and then I've got it coming out there behind the tire I haven't uh, chamfered the edge of that exhaust yet but you get the idea hey yeah, there's a view you don't get very often it's my powder coated brake pedals and stuff I could just go to sleep right here oh man it's nice okay oh I just have tips for days. So hole saw. So like for me, I need to do a hole saw in my, in that transmission cover and I got to do the hole saws and it's a big hole saw this big for the um, speed hut gauges. And it's a goofy gauge size. So none of the pods you get on eBay, none of those fit. Problem with hole saws is they do a lot. They, ha they just have a lot of torque because the force is so far out from the axis of the drill. So I just have so many problems with the walking um, and just hole sawing in a stable controlled fashion. So what I did was think, because I, I read all these things, well, hole saws like to go slow. Well, I wasn't really able to do that. First of all, these cordless drills are useless for hole saws, in my opinion, for the bigger ones. Um, and honestly, this DeWalt is so out of route, like there's so much run out in the chuck that it, it and, and hole saws by their nature are already not, they're rough cut things. They're not perfectly, you know, machined. So that along with the wobble and the chuck just made the, it unusable. So I looked at, okay, let me just get an old school drill. But the problem is you really need variable speed control and you need to be able to drill super slow and have a lot of power without your drill smoking. So I thought, well, what, what application is that like? And I figured out, you know, these, these concrete guys, they use, um, they use these drills that have a gear reducer inside for paddling like thin set and mortar and concrete, you know, like the stuff you see them doing in the buckets because you don't need a lot of speed, but you need a lot of force. And so this is from Harbor Freight, it was like 60 bucks. But this thing's a dream to hole saw with. I mean, it's just so much better. It's controlled, it goes slow, um, and it's got so much torque that it's not kicking you back, right? You just gotta make sure your work piece is fixed well. But this thing, because the gear reduction, it just chews right through it. You gotta be patient, but it's the, great, great, great purchase for me. Whoo, that was a huge update. And I know I forgot stuff. Oh, there it is. What was it? This is the JB Weld one, the other one that came with the uh, rubber booties. 
it's nice. I mean, it's a nice kit, but even the rubber booties, they just don't have the, they just don't have much flex, you know, like it, as soon as you go, like it just pulls on the front side. And these always rip. You read the reviews, they always rip. And it's cause they need more flexion and they have to be baggier to do that. Downright scrotal, if you ask me. So, yeah. I'm really looking forward to not having a fab anymore. I mean, I love fabricating, but man, the mess and the shavings and the shards and the metal splinters, I'm over it. If you have any questions or if you see I'm doing something horribly, horribly wrong, uh, let me know. I will try my best to change it. If you don't like something, well, you know, keep it to yourselves. And uh, other than that, yeah, stay, keep in touch. You know, a lot of people have been reaching out lately. It's nice. It's one, an indication that the channel's still growing, which it is. And two, like, it just means I'm approachable, which is a bit unusual, to be honest. But it's good. It's good. Keep, keep reaching out. It's mattsgarageshow at gmail.com. Like and subscribe if you feel like it. Uh, no pressure, bro. Yeah, man. Yeah. This restoration stuff, no joke, really. Whew. See you next time on Matt's Garage.